Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where we're curious which states you'd like to hear about next in the series. It might be the smallest state, but Rhode Island has made numerous contributions to the unending stream of human misery. Rebellions, fires, and vampires are just a few terrible things that have happened there. Let's begin with the story of a pirate. The Last Pirate the Golden Age of Piracy was over by 1730, but a few enterprising sailors continued the criminal tradition. Charles Gibbs was born in Newport, Rhode Island on November 5, 1798. His father had served in the Revolutionary War as a privateer. Privateers had a special role within the military. The government permitted them to commit acts of piracy against ships that belonged to enemy nations. According to Charles, as a young child, he wanted to follow in his father's footsteps, and he wouldn't have to wait long to enter the family business. When he was around 14, Charles joined the United States Navy. During the War of 1812, he served on the USS Hornet and the Chesapeake. But in 1813, he was captured after losing a battle in Boston Harbor, and then he was forced into the life of a pirate. This was the story Charles told about his life. It was also a lie. He never served in the Navy. Nobody knows if his father actually served in the war. But in 1816, Charles did serve aboard a schooner. He also joined a mutiny that removed the captain. Then he happily joined the new pirate crew that controlled the ship. Charles rose to the rank of captain because of a reputation for cruelty. Supposedly, he once had a man's arms and legs cut off. In another instance, an entire crew was locked in the hold of a ship, after which it was set on fire. On October 21, 1821, Charles commanded a fleet of four ships which were attacking merchants off the coast of Cuba. The USS Enterprise entered the conflict and surprised the pirates. The Navy destroyed the pirate ships, but didn't capture Charles, who escaped into the jungle. He traveled to Argentina, then spent the next few years working on other ships. But on the night of November 23, 1830, Charles joined another mutiny. This time, they killed the captain and the first officer. The crew helped themselves to the ship's cargo. Then the vessel was abandoned near Long Island, New York. Charles didn't have long to enjoy his newfound riches. Only two days after entering New York, he was arrested and sent to prison. In addition to being one of the last pirates, Charles had another claim to fame. The attorneys who prosecuted him were both sons of Alexander Hamilton and they didn't lose. Charles Gibbs was convicted of mutiny and murder. He was hanged on Ellis Island on April 22, 1831. The Door Rebellion For much of its history, Rhode Island wasn't a very democratic place. The colony of Rhode Island was created by a royal charter in 1663. Leaders within the territory were elected, however, only white men who owned land could vote in elections. When Rhode Island became part of the United States, its election laws didn't change. As the Industrial Revolution progressed, more people moved into the state. They didn't own land and were unhappy about not having a say in their government. One man would spend much of his life trying to expand voting rights. Thomas Wilson Dorr was born in Providence on November 5, 1805. In 1834, he was elected to the Rhode Island General Assembly. He tried to change the Constitution multiple times to expand voting rights. The motions were always opposed. By 1841, Thomas decided victory would require a different approach. He and his followers created a new political party called the People's Party. They submitted a new constitution to the public who voted overwhelmingly in favor of it. But the existing state government didn't consider any of this legal. In response, the People's Party had its own election and selected Thomas Dorr as governor. The existing governor, Samuel Ward King, was not amused. He declared martial law and offered a reward for the arrest of Thomas. Thomas fled the state. Meanwhile, in 1843, Rhode Island finally adopted a new constitution which allowed all white men to vote. Thomas thought his fight was over and it might be safe to return home, but he was wrong. In October, he came back to Providence and was immediately arrested. He was tried for treason and was found guilty. On June 27, 1844, Thomas was sentenced to hard labor for life. The public became angry after learning about his fate. 
In 1845, the state legislature passed a bill that granted amnesty to Thomas. Those who knew him said Thomas's health deteriorated quickly while he was in prison. He passed away a few years after his release in 1854. Mercy Brown Vampire Incident Tuberculosis was a widespread disease in the 19th century. Today we know that bacteria cause it, but some people used to think the condition came from the undead. In 1884, George and Mary Brown were living in Exeter, Rhode Island. They had two daughters, Mary and Mercy, and a son named Edwin. By the end of 1884, Mary and the oldest daughter were dead from tuberculosis. A few years later, in 1891, Mercy joined them. Next, Edwin became sick with the disease. Those who knew the family believed that the infection came from a vampire. More specifically, they thought that one of the dead family members had arisen as a member of the undead. They asked George for permission to examine the corpses of his loved ones. He gave permission and the town began its investigation. Unlike most of the bodies, Mercy's remains did not decompose at all. This was taken as evidence that she was a vampire. Thankfully, there was a ritual to free Mercy from living death and cure Edwin. They burned her heart and liver, then Edwin drank a solution containing the ashes. But the effort failed. Edwin passed away a few months later. George never contracted the disease and lived until 1922. Wood River Criticality Incident Rhode Island also contributed to the ever-growing list of nuclear accidents. Wood River Junction was a well-known place to the residents of Rhode Island. In 1874, it became the site of a railroad switching station. A nearby pond was also a great place to go fishing. By 1964, there was also a nuclear facility there. The workers would take waste from other nuclear sites and try to extract the uranium. They used chemicals to do this, so there usually weren't atomic reactions on the site. Robert Peabody worked there in the evenings. During the day, he was a car mechanic, but he didn't need to be a scientist to work at the facility. He simply needed to follow instructions. Most of the time, Robert would pour chemicals into uranium vats. As long as he used the right solutions, there was no danger. But some of the bottles contained uranium. Dumping that into the vats would cause a nuclear reaction. On July 24th, Robert showed up at work and started processing uranium. However, unknown to him, these staff had cleaned the night before. In the process, some of the bottles were moved and some of the labels weren't correct. Robert took one of the bottles and poured it into a nearby vat. Unfortunately, the contents of the bottle caused a nuclear reaction. There was a bright white flash. Robert yelled, then ran out of the room. The reaction didn't cause an explosion because the radioactive liquid splashed out of the vat and all over the room. Sadly, in the process, Robert received twice the amount of radiation required to kill a person. In one unfortunate moment, he was exposed to more radiation than any other human in history, except perhaps those killed by the nuclear bombs dropped on Japan. Robert survived for 49 hours after the accident. At first, he was very uncomfortable and had to be given sedatives. After several hours, he seemed to get better, but soon after that, he fell into a coma and never spoke again. Robert's wife received a settlement of $22,000, which would be worth about $211,000 today. She also developed throat cancer later in life, which she blamed on being near her husband's bed after the accident. The Station Nightclub Fire the building that would one day be known as The Station was built in 1946. It was initially a dive bar with a poor reputation. The business changed hands and names several times. By 1972, the location contained an Italian restaurant. The restaurant closed after the building caught on fire. In 2000, the former dive bar was renovated and turned into a nightclub. It also became a popular destination for bands from the 1980s. To keep the locals happy, the building's interior contained foam for soundproofing. The foam was highly flammable and violated building codes, but for some reason the owners of the station weren't cited for it. Several bands played at the club without incident. That changed on February 20th, 2003 when Great White performed. As the band went on stage, the club already had more people than its maximum allowed capacity. Then during the opening song, pyrotechnics were ignited. Sparks flew into the soundproofing material and it caught on fire. 
The band ran off stage within seconds of the fire starting. Smoke started filling the club's interior and the flames spread quickly. People began running for the front exit. Many of them were crushed to death as they all tried to fill the hallway at once. It only took six minutes for the fire to engulf the entire building. The station had 462 people in attendance that evening. The fire killed 100 of them and injured 230 more. One of the victims was the guitarist for Great White, Ty Longley. He ran back into the building to get his guitar. An investigation determined that lives would have been saved if the station had a sprinkler system, but since the building was constructed in 1946, it was exempt from the requirement to have one. The first criminal charges were brought against the manager of Great White, Daniel Michael Bikula. He set off the pyrotechnics, so prosecutors charged him with 100 counts of manslaughter. In May 2006, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison, but he was released in March 2008. When he left prison, Daniel made a statement to the families of the victims. Since the fire, I have wanted to tell the victims and their families how truly sorry I am for what happened that night and the part that I had in it. I never wanted anyone to be hurt in any way. I never imagined that anyone ever would be. I know how this tragedy has devastated me, but I could only begin to understand what the people who lost loved ones have endured. I don't know that I'll ever forgive myself for what happened that night, so I can't expect anybody else to. The club owners were also charged with manslaughter and sentenced to prison. Like Daniel, they were released after two years. Thanks to various lawsuits, nearly $176 million have been paid to the families of those who died in the fire. The Rhode Island Ripper Even small states have serial killers. Jeffrey Mallet was born on November 29, 1970 in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. He was quiet as a child. Those who knew him said he was very nice. He graduated from high school in 1989, then he got a job at a paper mill. Jeffrey appeared to lead a completely normal and harmless life, but that would change in February 2003. One day he was outside a laundromat. He encountered a prostitute named Audrey Harris. Jeffrey convinced her to go to his apartment. As soon as they entered the living room, he strangled Audrey. After dispatching his victim, he wasn't sure what to do with the remains. An episode of the television show The Sopranos gave him the answer. In the episode, someone is murdered. The body is put into a bathtub and then transformed into smaller parts. Jeffrey thought he could do the same. When he was finished, Audrey was placed into trash bags. He tossed them into dumpsters all over the town of Woonsocket. In April 2004, Jeffrey decided to murder again. He picked up a woman named Christine C. Dumont and then took her back to his apartment. Jeffrey repeated the process that had worked for his previous victim. On July 4, 2004, he was at a fireworks show at a local park. Jeffrey picked up a woman named Stacy Goulet and took her back to his apartment. He strangled and disposed of her, just as he had done with the previous two victims. In June 2004, he picked up yet another woman, but this time the plan didn't work. As he tried to strangle her, she headbutted him and poked him in the eye, then she ran away. She eventually identified Jeffrey to the police. On July 17th, he was arrested. After a few hours, Jeffrey confessed to killing the woman. He claimed he was glad the police caught him because he couldn't stop himself, and he was very remorseful about killing them. Investigators tried to locate the remains of Jeffrey's victims. They retrieved most of Stacy Goulet. The other two women were never found. Jeffrey was sentenced to two life terms plus 10 years. He will be eligible for parole in 2047. Are you surprised about the horrible things that have happened in Rhode Island? And did we miss anything important? Tell us what you think in the comments below and let us know what state you would like to learn about next. In the meantime, be sure to like this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and watch another episode if you want to learn more about humanity's utterly and unnecessarily terrible past. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.